Oh, a friend of mine was uh, uh, just staying with me, Marcel. I, I, you may know him as Amiga Marcel or Marcel von Clownstick. And uh, uh, his daughter is young, uh, not quite a teenager or just a teenager, learning jokes in English and started texting him jokes to tell me while we were driving along in the car. And so I got to tell him some of my favorite jokes. She did not know the interrupting cow joke. Does everyone know the interrupting cow? Knock, knock. Interrupting cow. Moo! This see, is how. See it, but which everyone knows, but not everyone knows the variation. Knock, knock. Interrupting coefficient of friction. Moo! <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. <laughs> Stupid joke. A friend of mine has a theory that every joke has a but. Every joke has a victim. And I, I don't know that that's true, but it's real hard to come up with examples where it's not true. Every joke I can think of has, you're making fun of something or someone, some animal or some... The cow. <laughs> Sci unimaginative scientists, maybe. Remember when shots used to come in those really hard plastic shot glasses? They're really... It's a prank that I won't do anymore. I can't do it here because I don't have one of them. But it's this prank that I will only do now if I tell you in advance that I'm doing the prank like I am now, except I don't have one, so I can't actually do it for you. But once I start doing this and once I tell you, I'm telling you about this prank that I don't get to do anymore. I've already taken one of those small, short, hard plastic cups and put it back here without you knowing about it. <coughs> and then I, I say, I've, I have uh, uh, learned this new technique from my chiropractor. For I got this crick in my neck and it's just amazing. You go like this and you, and you crush. Whoops. And it's super. <laughs> oh my God. He's going to hate me. But it's all on camera. <laughs> oh my God, it's so great. So, my friend Michael and I are at an airport and our plane's delayed. So, we're at the bar at the airport and. As usual, we're entertaining everyone. We're, you know, and, and there's a whole crew of us, and the, including the bartender, and they've got the hard plastic cups. And so I'm telling this crew, there's this prank that I used to do that's just so wonderful, but I don't do it anymore because it's so horrifying. Because it's just really horrifying, the cracking, crunching sound as I do this with my head. It's just <laughs> <coughs> so. I'm telling these people this, the whole thing, and I take the cup and I say, you know, before I start even telling you this, I've already got a position back here, so I'm sitting here like this, and I tell them the whole story, and then I do this, and I, and I grab my head and I pull it and I crush the cup, and they're all aghast at how horrible it is because it is truly a horrible thing to witness. But I'm like stupid and not thinking about it. There's a whole bar here, but next to the bar is a deli, and there's a person that just put in a sandwich order and is standing there waiting for the sandwich order and heard me talk about chiropractor, so turned to look to see what I was saying and saw only that. <laughs> we thought we were going to have, the person was going to faint. We thought we, we ran over to grab, it was like, oh. Like, <laughs> I goofed up the microphone. 
No, no, it attacked me. I was in the middle of a really good story, and it attacked me. <laughs> okay. Do you want to try, you want to try hooking no, 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 it back no, on? No, no, no. Yeah, no, I got it back on, except I didn't get this positioning oh, it's, correct. Oh, it's broke. It's broken? It literally is broken. Okay, will it stay, or do we have to get me a new one? No, that's what it gets for attacking I broke it? I owe you three dollars. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I did. Technical difficulties. We should probably mute that. I'll take it. I okay. Just have a release button. I was. Yeah, you better go get a few replacements, because I don't know how long you plan on me talking, but maybe one for every 20 minute yeah. segment. <laughs> <laughs> We're not starting yet. Uh, should I go get, I can still go get a soda. Oh my god. Guess what? <laughs> so my neck has been really sore. But I found this thing my chiropractor if I go like oh god. <laughs> Is that bad horrible? Jesus, that's so <laughs> I <s> <laughs> They have them. <laughs> water. Are there water somewhere? I don't know. I'm just dying. I'm dying for water. And no, just the water. Plain old water. <laughs> oh, it's American beer? <laughs> All right, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, well, so this is uh, Pete with RJ. We want to do something really informal. Unfortunately, we forgot to tell RJ. That's how informal this yeah. is. Um, everyone's had pizza? Yeah. It was good? Yeah. We like it? Yeah, good place? Good. Best pizza ever. <laughs> um, so this is completely free form and open. The, the, the minister or master of mischief is up front, as we just saw a witness, because he, like, killed himself or whatever that was. So I was like, oh, my God, his neck. Um, <laughs> oh, you didn't know it was coming. I, I did. You got me. You got me. Okay. Who wants the first question to get us kicked off here? Ask RJ a question. Okay. I will ask the first question. Is it true that you microwaved fish? way back when and people had to leave the building it's a true story is this working i i can talk loud enough that everyone can hear me it's just that it's gonna bust this microphone all to hell <laughs> okay regular okay fine so it's true. We, uh, 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 I was young and stupid, naive. I was really, I, I had learned enough about cooking just to be dangerous. And I would thought myself, you know, that 
I could do fish and I knew how to do fish. Fish is real hard to do correctly and it's real easy to stink up the place when you cook fish, man. <laughs> and there was a time I simply didn't know, but it's true that you should never microwave fish for one real simple reason. When you do the uh, water cell, the water in the cells gets energetic and causes the cells, the cellular structure to break apart which not only makes fish mealy, but also releases all of the other stuff that was in there and doesn't smell so good. <laughs> and, and I didn't know, and it's true, once, once upon a time in Amiga history, I microwaved a piece of fish, and the place stank so bad that I emptied the building. We ended up getting a, a friend. They had one of those, you know, four-foot-tall vacuums that you wheel around, set up in the front door of the building to vent the building and everything. It was just horrible. And, and even better, I, I, it, it, the, the reason it happened is because I, I microwaved it too long. The plastic melted. There was a smell of melting plastic as well as this corroded fish. The whole thing was just horrible. And, um, uh, and, and it just... It, it, really, truly evacuated the building. Everyone ran outside until we could vent the place. It was just an amazingly bad smell. But I, I was humiliated and yet stubborn, was taking on this, what? What? And I sat there and ate that fish, picking the pieces out around the melted bits of plastic. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> The uh, question is, did I get hit in the, uh, over the head for the bad idea bat for doing that? And yes, I, I often got hit over the head with that, the, it, 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 which was uh, true. We had, you might not have seen the pictures. They, uh, they're out there. One of the delightful bits of news that I get to report here is, is that I've uncovered a bunch of old Amiga stuff over the last month. And we got an interesting thing we're thinking about doing with it. But <coughs> uh, uh, one of the things I found is the old picture of Bob Pariseau holding that bat over us. Bob is one of those unsung heroes from the Amiga days. There's like, there's probably 10, maybe even 15 original Amiga people that just don't uh, ever get any press. And, and they, 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 they were instrumental as much as anyone else was in the success of the company. There's this one person we were remembering the other day, Darlene McDonald, her name was, and she had something to do with accounts payable. I don't know exactly what, but I, I just know that the, when the creditors <coughs> were trying to get money out of us, they talked to Darlene, and Darlene somehow managed to put the fire out over and over again so many times that we called her our official firefighter. We had this little red firefighter's hat that she used to wear around the office and to all the Christmas parties and stuff like that. And, and we wouldn't have survived if it weren't for her efforts. And, and yet, you know, you never see your name in print or anything like that. Although, you, you, you know, you, m you might be able to spot her signature here and there, but I don't believe her signature is on the lid of the Amiga 1000. And that's too bad. But we have a chance to correct all of that someday. Yes, my friend. Can you tell us about the early Amiga culture? And is there anything that you did to cultivate that culture? And is there any lessons that uh, modern startups can uh, use? I'm asked to reflect on early Amiga culture. And are there any lessons that modern startups can learn from that? And that baseball bat thing was not only a kind of, you know, one of the cultural icons of, of that time, but also of Amiga, because we did resolve a lot of our conflicts that way. And it was never mean, but we did often beat each other with that damn big foam bat, you know, and, and which is, by the way, in case you don't know the connection, the same foam bat that we used to make the boom sound in the original Boeing demos, that same bat that we used to use to beat each other with. And, and it... it And it, it reflected, I, I think, 
one of the things that's getting lost more and more in the companies that I've done over the years, especially the bigger the company, the farther away you get from that sense of camaraderie, that, that, that intimacy. And, and it was an intimacy where, you know, we knew the names of one another's pets and, and, and you, you didn't have to ask about dietary considerations when you're inviting someone over for dinner. You knew already. And it was, you know, that kind of closeness with each other. And part of that, I believe, came out of the fact that, you know, we had that, many of us had that driving force behind us that we weren't doing it for the money. We are doing it for something bigger, some more noble undertaking on our parts and I, I think uh, 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 that's a quality that's been lost in le later efforts I was part of that that kind of humility that kind of acceptance and no one was trying to get ahead no one was ever trying to advance your career and worried about promotions or any of that stuff. It was just a bunch of wacky people who were on a mission together. And, and, and like, like I, I point to 3DO as an example of the Amiga operating system done right, the Amiga hardware platform done right, where we learned all of the mistakes with the Amiga and we refused to make those mistakes again from day one. You know, th things that we took for granted before we didn't. With the 3DO and, and I love what we did with the 3DO because of that, because it was really like a more mature take on that same sort of energy, that same sort of feel, that thing we tried to create together originally. But 3DO was a big business effort. It was with, you know, big money behind it and big names and and it was and we were all a decade older, whatever it was, and, and knew a lot more, had a lot more experience, got it right, you know. Some of the stuff I'm I'm uh, uh one of the pleasant announcements I get to make is Someone just found a copy of the 1.1 source code in his Amiga stuff. And, <laughs> and I'm embarrassed to put it out there because I remember what kind of a programmer I was back then. <laughs> but I don't care. I don't care. And I mostly, I, I guess I don't care about any of that stuff at all because that, that lovely wonderful <laughs> heartfelt thing that was the Amiga from the beginning is is still the Amiga now still to this day with the kind of people that contribute to it and this this little announcement I have to make which I, I think this is a nice time I'll, I'll tell you my little announcement <laughs> so I did I went to dug in um, uh, uh, Dale's warehouse and I've been cleaning my house. Those of you who know me, I did a big remodel of my downstairs just before my big birthday party a half a decade ago now and, and, uh, and gathered a lot of Amiga stuff together for that. And now I got to get out of Dale's warehouse and there's a whole new big wonderful bunch of Amiga stuff that came out of that. And I, I've got all this old Amiga stuff of mine and it's finally gathered all together in one place. Uh, including fun stuff like the uh, I used to do this going around the around the world giving these the telling the story of the making of the Amiga and to Amiga user groups all around the world I used to tell the story I spent about a about a year and a half after I was out of Amiga just doing that just for fun just telling people but after a while it it I think it kind of got old I think everyone had sort of heard the story already I was still getting invited to do it, but it kind of felt like, you know, it had had its day. So I decided to do it one last big time and do the big telling of the Amiga story. And I digitized a bunch of photos and had a whole slideshow together and stuff like that. I did it at um, the Amiga show in Chicago, uh, Amy Expo in Chicago that year. And, and it was the grand final telling. And a friend of mine who was a video producer at the time, got the entire thing on uh, beta 
tape, there's this whole recording of me telling this whole speech that's never seen the light of day, that sat in boxes this whole time, this thing I have. So I've got, like, all the stuff I have. I'm one of the original Agnes stacks. One of the original Agnes stacks. The souvenir, the lovely souvenirs that EA gave us with the original chips embedded in epoxy and... I was just, you know, a bunch of lovely stuff, and I'm trying to figure out what should I do with this stuff. And, and uh, you know, I, I could give some of it to museums, but I, I don't know how much more the museums need because a lot of Amiga people have been giving a lot of stuff to museums already. And we were talking about, I'm, I'm a, a quick side note, I uh, do a dinner party at my place in Redwood City down in the Bay Area. And if you'd like to come to a dinner party, please drop me an email, rj at michael.org. I've started doing dinner parties again. Uh, small things, eight-person dinner parties, not big extravaganzas. Fully vaxxed people, but it's indoor and it's maskless. And but uh, we're starting to, to goof around <coughs> like that again. And... Uh, uh, one of the little gems that I get to show at this is some of my original Amiga stuff that I've, uh, you know, brought out of Dale's locker. And, and, you know, I know how much people love to see this stuff. And I'm thinking, after I'm done doing my own dinner parties for, like, it's going to be about a year before I stop, I'm thinking I might take a couple of months off and do a, a quick trip around the world and have people invite me to their homes for dinner and kind of set up a quick trip around the world and get invitations to people's home for dinner. But while I'm doing that, also have maybe an Amiga party in each one of the places and take a pile of this, this original stuff and put it in flight cases and throw it in the airplane and fly it around the world and maybe give people a chance to see this stuff who otherwise wouldn't get a chance to touch it themselves and stuff like that. I'm thinking I might do something like that. But then when I get back, what I'm thinking we might do with this pile of stuff, and I'm going to contact Dale and other MEGA people to see if they'd like to get in on it, is to do an auction where we auction off the MEGA stuff and let MEGA people, MEGA collectors, whoever would like to try to get some of this original historical stuff, um, uh, uh, pony up some dough to build up a, a kitty of cash from an auction, or maybe a couple of auctions, that we would use borrowing a page from my mentor, Fred Maurice, who is a wonderful person, set up this fund at the end that I, I think I would like to try to do the same thing for the Amiga community. We take this pile of money that we get from the auction, and we use it to create an annual award that we give away that some panel, some committee, some group decides once a year. That was the most interesting Amiga thing that someone tried to do in the last 12 months. Or, or the, the, you know, and I don't even know what that means, Amiga. I, I, I mean to be as inclusive as possible and, and do it as, as big as and generous a way as possible. But, you know, just say, like, we made 100K from the auction. And then we put that in a bank and it makes 5000 a year. We use that 5000 once a year to make an award for the Amiga community and, and as, as an, a way to inspire people to keep working, to keep trying. And it, it could be anything. It could be hardware. It could be software. It could be something virtual. It could be old-timey Amiga, maybe something more modern. I don't know. Like I said, this idea is just occurring to me, and I, I, I thought it might uh, break the idea here and, and see, generate some discussion from it. But... I, I, and, and, you know, maybe in one year it, it only makes $1,000. Maybe in the next year it makes 25000 because the market's doing well, whatever. You just never touch the, the nest egg. You never touch the kitty. You just give away whatever interest it ma manages to make in the last 12 months. Something like that. And you set it up so it lives forever, you know, as long as somebody's willing to get together to be a panel of judges to decide what to do with the dough. I don't know. It's an interesting idea, anyway. 
Anyone got any thoughts on that? <laughs> Even an interesting question is what would you call it? <laughs> the le Amiga Legacy Fund. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe not that then. <laughs> I have lots of cats in the video. <laughs> I have a question for you. It might be a little bit different because obviously this is mostly Amiga related, but stepping back in time prior to that, on a personal level, what 8-bit computers, if you used any, and you probably did, at home, did you use? Okay, but you make me remember I did not answer your second question, which I'll get back to. Okay, the second question being, so how do we apply, you know, how, how do we get modern startups to have that sort of quality that Amiga had? And, and that is, in fact, related to the amazing secret thing I need to talk with Jerry about. But that's... <laughs> <laughs> but I personally um, cut my teeth on an Apple II. My mentors, Dolores and Fred Maurice, had an art collection, and they got an Apple II to set up a database for their art collection. And it was an Apple II, and set up a database for real courageous words back in those days. <laughs> By God, but uh, that's, that's how I learned 8-bit uh, for the first time, My, uh, was not only with the Apple II, but then, uh, uh, you know, I, it was so easy to program, and it had Apple Soft under the hood, and, and so I, I had a lot of fun. I really learned how to push that machine around. It was also the first machine that I fell asleep in front of at midnight so that my mo mentor Fred comes down and jiggles my shoulder, wake up, go to sleep, oh, okay, bye. <laughs> First time ever I fell asleep in front of a computer was that Apple II. But um, uh, uh, um, before that I had other, you know, uh, uh, tinier game system stuff around me. And the one that I, I absolutely would credit the most would be the Intellivision. That was the, the machine that I fell in love with where uh, w one of my in-laws kids had it and I missed the entire party including the dinner I said leave me alone loudly enough that they left me alone down in the basement <laughs> playing with that game system and then went home that night because tank was the game that I loved the most of all of the games because of the amazing way that they could take those pixels you might remember there, those pixels were as big as your head, baby. Those pixels were gigantic. And they could somehow take a small clump of them and represent what looked like a tank rotating in position. It was just amazing to me. So I went home with graph paper and, and did it myself, figured out how to do it myself. And little tiny Bob Michaels, little brain, you know, starting to take all of this information in. God, it was great. But, uh, uh, um, uh, and then even before that, by the way, is uh, I, I get to lay credit to an amazing little thing. Back when, when I was too young to know what I was touching at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, they once had one of the Pong games, the original Pong game on an oscilloscope. That, that where, you know, it, it didn't, it wasn't boop, 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 straight line Pong like it is now, but it did a sort of a bouncing over the net Pong. And, uh, and I touched that game. I played that game a little bit when I was a little kid. The Museum of Science and Industry with Chicago, I, s I hear it's still awesome. But back then it was the you know, magic childhood of my youth. It was such an amazing place. So, but back to Jerry's other question, which is so fascinating to me. Because... Um, you know, uh, the, the question is, how do, you, how, do you, how do you do a startup today? How can you do a startup today? I, you still happily, well, I don't know if it's still true. I'm not as involved in the, the games as I was when I first joined Google and Android. But we saw back then, uh, 10, 9, 8 years ago, there were people who were becoming millionaires by developing games for iPhone or, or for Android. Mostly for iPhone is how you make your money. But... Um, you know, it was a, a one-person or a two-person job. Between my Sony gig and my Google gig, I, I did my own game. 
it, w it was a basically a complete game. It just needed uh, a bunch of levels designed for it. But what it didn't have was graphics. It didn't have audio. I, I just went out to the internet and got beeps and boops. And, and uh, it was a building that had three different levels of height. So I went and got a stop sign and had green, yellow, and red, you know, that I cut out of the stop sign for the rooftops. You could see it was a three down, 3D. It's a long story, but I did it myself. I, I was able to pull off an entire game myself. And, and I know that that kind of, you know, real small thing is it has seen a resurgence recently that some people are able to pull off that thing but the magic of doing a startup like that you know I hate to say it I'm gonna be blunt here a lot of what's gone wrong is that idealism has been supplanted by uh, a desire to fill your wallet that people have become much more interested in doing these things because of it because of the big potential payoff someday and uh, and we sure as hell didn't do Amiga for that. <laughs> I mean, th uh, there was a little bit of, ooh, we're doing a startup, you know, but that was, no one, uh, no one really believed it, it was going to reward us beautifully. We dreamed about it a little bit, but, y you know, uh, everyone really was doing it just because we wanted to. It was a lovely thing to do with our energy, with our skills, and that where we hoped we could actually make a difference with humans, that, that, that we could make people's lives actually better. And yeah, we, we were successful with that. I'll help. <laughs> I will take that. That part makes me so happy. I still hear this story every once in a while, you know, of someone who got a, a break in the graphics industry or, or became a you know, a, an IT specialist or whatever that somehow did manage to do something wonderful related to the Amiga. It make, makes, makes all of us so happy. And, and those of us, the early people who did talk about this and still, who still do commune with each other from time to time about how important that side of it was to us. We all sleep really well at night, you know. We all s feel like we set out to try to do something and, and had a great amount of success making people happy and make pe making people better. Yes, sir. So that's the question about the idealism. The there a lot of us, you know, we talk about but being idealistic, but, you know, did we really think about it? Did we visualize it? And, and I, I really, I personally can't speak too much for other people, except that, that to put him on the spot a little bit, as I've always done without compunction, my, my older brother, Ron, we used him as our typical consumer that we were shooting for. And by which I mean not computer savvy. And he would take great exception to me characterizing him that way. But it was true at the time. I mean, even though he was a, a COBOL programmer, bless his soul, he was a <laughs> COBOL <laughs> Although, quick side note, he was a COBOL programmer who retired from the business and then in the year 1999 made a whole bunch of money as a contractor fixing the mistakes that he made a decade <laughs> earlier. <laughs> but we used my brother Ron as, you know, as our target, someone who was Smart, someone who was savvy, someone who had, you know, had it together and knew how to, w how to move a mouse and you know, could recognize whatever. But um, 
you know, not computer smart, not really, you know, super intelligent with computers, and not rich, not, you know, rolling around in dough, and someone that would have to fight his way to, you know, be a become a good user of it. And we, we constantly worked for someone like that. And I, I can't speak for the other people, but I would myself visualize both him and my mentors sitting back someday with their hands on these computers actually using it and and the th I, I felt in my bones that feeling that I would have someday and that I did have one day when uh, when I, I gave to my mentors uh, an Amiga an entire Amiga computer rig including the monitor and a whole set of games and stuff like that that uh, I stood back and watched them play and watched their kids go and visit, my kids go and visit them and play on the Amiga computer that they had in the guest room at their house and stuff like that. And, and that <coughs> after uh, Fred and Dolores both died, they died off the, a few years ago now, I got back that Amiga computer and that monitor and that original stack of computer that I had given to my mentors I'm thinking of auctioning that off as a set, you know, and see what, what uh, some collector might be willing to put toward it. I'm also thinking, by the way, that if we did do this auction thing and use it to raise the money for this fund, I'm thinking I, I'd uh, do a matching thing. Whatever money we a actually manage to get people to bid for this stuff, I'll, I'll double it. Uh, I'll match it for the, for the auction, you know, something like that. And try, to, try to make it into a significant pile of dough that... Not to change anyone's plans. Th that's not the goal. The goal is to not to get you to do things thinking you might get a, a, an award like this. It'll never be that big. It's never going to change your life. You know, it'll be five, ten thousand dollars whatever it is. The whole point is just to give you a good solid pat on the back if you've done something magnificent. That's, that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> And not only do I like the idea of uh, collectors, uh, you know, funding it in that way, but I like the idea of me matching it, too, for the exact same reason. Yes, please. Not be too abstract. Like, when you were developing the Amiga, you were using Sun computers. And then once the Amiga was out, people used the Amiga to develop the Lynx, the Jaguar, and all these other consoles. I was just wondering if you could muse on that a little bit like I know there's a quote from Alan Kay who said small talk was not meant to be small talk forever small talk was meant to be the tool with which people then made the next tool and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that <laughs> pleasant thought about the development systems and how you know, they boot up one another over time. I, I don't know how many of you know the story. I think Dale just recently uncovered the original Sage computer that we used. The, the Sage computer was a, uh, a little tiny 68,000 computer and bragged at being one of the first workplace multitasking computers, was supposed to handle four at a time on it. I, I don't know how well it would do it four at a time. I do know how well it did with ten at a time because we had ten of us jammed on that same machine and it did not do well at all. No, no, no. But, you know, did those people that put the Sage together, did they ever know, did they ever find out that they booted up the Amiga, that it was their efforts that, that got us onto the Amiga? One of the sta stories you may know is that, that we were like, you know, a desperate bunch of kids work living off a shoestring when, when we did the Amiga. It was really, you know, I mean, the, the story includes not only 10 people on one tiny little computer, but p story, like Jay Minor taking out a second mortgage on his house so we would make a payroll once and stuff like that. It was like that kind of effort. And... You know, it, when... Finally, when Commodore came along, the, um, among the many really wonderful things that happened, the, the best thing that they did was they bought us those Sun microsystem computers to do our work on because it was suddenly instead of 10 people on one computer, each person had a full, you know, 
workstation to work on with your own storage devices and everything. It was like a miracle to us to all of a sudden have that much power. Each and every engineer suddenly, overnight, when Commodore bought us, overnight we had that much power. It was just, it was breathtaking. It was so good. And, and I wonder, does the people, at, do the people at Sun ever know how instrumental that the work that they did was toward bringing out the Amiga? And then, although we do rub their noses in it often, you had to use the Amiga to develop the links. When, when we developed the links, we used the Amiga as our development toolkit. And then when uh, Tari bought the links from Epix, they had to use the Amiga as their <laughs> development system, and they had to go out and buy a bunch of Amigas. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they know they use the Amiga for their development <laughs> because we never let them forget it. <laughs> I didn't know about the Jaguar. That's a, that's a new one on me. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's funny. The, uh, when we did the 3DO, we originally developed the 3DO using the Amiga as the development system. But when uh, Electronic Arts slash 3DO bought uh, the company where we had created the, the, um, the original system. Our company was called NTG. Uh, when they uh, uh, bought the company, they said part of the deal's got to be that we got to get rid of this Amiga thing. You know, we got to, no more Amiga, we got to switch to a Mac. And I said, well, why, do we, why, why not the Amiga? I mean, the Amiga's doing fine, and if, if we have it be the development for the system, it'll become more as a popular, why not help it? Why not push it? And, and one of the EA people said, because the Amiga's got that stink factor. Stink factor, he called it. And I, and, and, uh, I, I well, I wanted to punch the guy. <laughs> But I, I was overruled with it, and the, the funny thing is that, you know, they regretted it. They came back to regret it because the stuff that they put together on, on the Macintosh to do the, the 3DO development was, you know, really far inferior to what they, we had on the um, Amiga. Plus, they, they couldn't get Mac developers to get behind the 3DO effort. We had you. We could have turned to Amiga people and said, 3DO, we need better this, we need better that. And we easily did do stuff like that. We had that kind of energy behind us bec because there were so many believers in it and then people that had jumped on the bandwagon to help make it really happen and develop whatever it was that we needed. So I, d I don't know what would have happened if that call hadn't been made. Or if, for instance, if we hadn't sold the, the, the NTG system to 3DO, but if we had sold it, I don't know, directly to some other competitor, Sega or something. But it didn't happen. <laughs> Do you remember what specific Amiga tools you were using to develop for the 3DO? The uh, question is, is specifically what Amiga tools did we use to develop for the 3DO? Uh, it was... Uh, we, we used both of the C's that were popular then, Aztec C and Lattice C, uh, because they had different reasons for the, the results that they, we create, they created, so we used them both. Uh, and VistaPro. <laughs> Do you remember VistaPro? Oh, yay, VistaPro. <laughs> I can't remember the name of it. It was something like uh, the El Capitan Wild Ride or something like that where we, we used Vista Pro to create this uh, uh, ride as if you were on some sort of gravity-defying motorcycle that could go right up the face of cliffs and stuff like that. And you did this figure eight that on one side of the Yosemite Valley, using Vista Pro, was uh, the Angel Falls, and on the other side was El Capitan. And there were no trees in the way, so we didn't have to worry about trees. But you just whip around on this thing and go back and forth. And I, I made a loop of it and, it, and it was the recording that we used when we were selling the 3DO in the early days, one of those early demos that we had, that, that, you know, that we were showing that uh, the system could play movies. And we, w we would say it in this really, we would say it in a way where we're showing you this demo to show you that it, we can play movies. This is a m movie that we created on a different commu computer and we're just showing you 
the playback of the movie. But the, the, the marketing people always found a way to manage to not mention that this is an actual 3D thing that you're experiencing here. And they'd forget somehow or say it just the right, wrong way or whatever. And yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't be part of that. But we did all the demos, all, all everything for the original 3DO. Everything was on the Amiga. We did the, um, uh, emulated the chips and certain functionality of the chips on the Amiga long before we went to actual hardware with a lot of that stuff. Uh, uh, created a lot of the demos, almost all of the demos were originally created on the Amiga and uh, because we had these emulators that were running on it that were promising us that they were going to be equivalent to what the chips would do when the chips were finally ready. So we believed that they were chip accurate screens that we were grabbing and we realized that even, even though we can only do a single screen at a time here, we can do many of them and record them on a, a good single frame video recorder and then play that back in real time and have an actual demo of what the system would work w like when the system was actually working. And w not only did we do that, but then later when the system was actually working, we were able to put up those two demos side by side and prove to, at least to ourselves, that we hadn't been bullshitting ourselves, that it was really going to work that way. It was really cool. Oh, we had such cool demos that we did on the Amiga. The niftiest of them all was this one called Fire, where it was a brick building that I, I got from Chicago, a brick building against a blue sky. And every time you press the fire button, you'd light more fire in one of some of the windows of this building. And when the fire would light in the, uh, in the windows, the smoke would start to billow out, and but only out of the windows that were actually burning. And the smoke would you know, merge with other smoke and get thicker and denser. And it was really good looking fire, really effing good looking smoke. It was just amazing you know, that you could do it with a system like this. And you keep pressing that fire button until every window in the place is burning and the smoke is going up. And then you start using the controller to control the direction of the wind. So you can blow this smoke around that's blowing up out. It's like super realistic and wonderful and extremely cool. But then the next time you press the fire button after the whole thing was running, all the flame would go out. And, and that's what I did. But the guy, the marketing guy that learned how to do the demo right, he'd get everyone ooing and aahing over it. And he says, yeah, but I'm more powerful than this fire. And he'd turn with his face to the screen and go, when he'd press that button. And all the, it was just awesome. It was really so cool. <laughs> Yeah, but we did that on the Amiga, and you know, including to do the smoke right, you needed all the, the transparency, translucency, all these special effects that we had created as graphics effects on the Amiga, on the um, on the 3DO. But we had emulated them on the Amiga to prove that they would work and they would interact the correct way and stuff like that. And so, that demo was one of the demos. That fire demo was one of the demos that we did originally, fakey and then did the real thing later on with the hardware to really wow people that, with, at, well not, at that point we weren't wowing investors anymore. That was just to, you know, like prove to Trip that we had not been lying to him this whole time, that we really were going to be able to do that. Was Trip the source of the comment about the Amiga State? Um, no, Trip wasn't the, the person who said it, but pers Trip was the person at the table who nodded in agreement, and so did everyone else. You could have taken them all. Yeah, oh, I, 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 yes, <laughs> I, I wanted to, but, but the whole deal rested on it, the deal rested on it. Yeah, the deal rested on it. And it was such a good deal. I mean, it was really an awesome, the whole thing. If, if only, you know, if only people were smarter. Because <laughs> the whole, the basic idea of 3DO could have worked if, if they had recognized that, you know, Hardware companies have to make money too, you know. I, if, except for that small detail, 3DO was a great idea. <laughs> yes, please.
What's your name? Doug. Doug started out by pointing out I got a stain on my shirt here. I'm sorry that I'm ruining things here. <laughs> and and not 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 just the three D O, but I, I will even lump the links in there. The I mean not I mean uh, not just the Amiga, but I would even lump the links in there. The 3DO less so. The 3DO doesn't have the, a lot of love out there. There's some, but not a lot. The IBM PC, you don't find societies. Dreamcast has people get together, but you don't see what we see with the Amiga. You just, you don't, you don't see it. You don't see this energy. This, and it's all around the world. People that just keep loving on this machine. And, and I like the links, too very much and I love the community and there's still a lot of people that are working hard and developing games for that and I've decided I did this game that uh, that I had worked on uh, earlier 10 years ago and it was uh, I had it running on Android and on the iPhone but I've decided uh, since then that if I ever do another game at all it's at least going to have an Amiga copy and a Lynx copy, and I'll get a 3DO copy out there as well, <laughs> just because. I mean, I have to. I have to. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just, that the, the Lynx and the Amiga both had that from the beginning, that, that the energy, I, I, don't, I really don't know how to describe it, except that it, like, it feels in my heart like it comes out of, that, that you want to do it, that you love to do it, not that you're trying to find a way to stay alive and make money off of it. That, that, that edge that you get when you've got to figure out how to tap into civilization and get them to give you, you know, and the, the bucks you need to stay in your apartment this month. It's, it, it feels so separate from the energy that we had at Amiga where it was, it was so much for the love of it, for the... the drive of doing that, that coolness. I mean, uh, well, okay, I can't talk about 3D, I'm about uh, uh, Google, but I, 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 I'll reflect a little bit on Sony. Everything that we did at Sony was from beginning to end, from, from word one, it was all about making money. You know, was, are, are we going to be able to, to if, if we work on this technology, will we be able to leverage it into a way that makes money for Sony? If, 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 if we do this stuff, you know, will it help developers? And because we help developers, it's going to help Sony. W there was so little of, oh my God, look at how cool these, these, uh, these you know, uh, the SPUs are. What the hell can we use it for? Let's go have some fun and invent stuff. You know, the energy that's like behind um, uh, the Ducks demo of the PS3. Have you ever seen the Ducks demo? Do you know what that is? So it, 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 the, PS, the PlayStation line has had a Ducks demo around forever and they showed a, a duck on the PlayStation on, on uh, water and leaving a ripple on water. And people are like, well, holy moly, look at that. You know, an actual duck on, on water. And then on the PlayStation 2, they had multiple ducks on water, and each duck is leaving its own ripples in the water, and the ripples are overlapping, and, and people are like, my God, look at this, you can't believe it. And, and PlayStation 3 had the duck demo, and the duck comes out into a, it drops into a sink, and it's really amazing, and this duck's floating around in the sink, and, and you can drive it around, and it's really, I mean, the ripples and everything are just gorgeous. And, and you know, so where's the second duck? Where's the third duck? You know, how awesome it is. And it's, it's like they have this giant funnel of ducks out of school. Uh, off camera up above and they just open the valve and like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ducks come out and they're splashing out of the sink and they're jostling over each other and it's you know just a breathtaking demonstration of the the awe strength of the playstation 3 and uh, and and i never got a chance to meet the person who invented that demo but that's the person i want working at my company is the person that has you know that kind of drive that kind of spirit 
But, you know, I'm, I, I, I've uh, been contemplating a lot of options in, in my own, li own life and what's going to happen next. And one of the things I've, I've been thinking about is what it would be like to do another startup today. Well, you know, how would that work and what's it like out there? And, and even though I've, I've got cool ideas, I don't know how much people want anymore, can afford anymore, or willing to take the chances anymore. I don't know what the spirit is, what the mood is out there for people taking those kinds of chances. And if they're, you know, the startups that I know you pay you almost nothing, you know, you get paid pennies. And, and what you're doing is you're hoping in the long-term success of the, the equity in the company that you have, you know, and that's, you're, you're working not to make a buck, but you're working to accomplish something, to approve something. And that's what I've done my whole life. Every startup I've ever done, except with the exception of 3DO, the NTG thing. Every other thing has been with the intention of doing something noble, something grand. 3DO was about making money. The whole NTG thing was about making money. But doing it the right way, making money the right way, but still. And, and I just, I don't know if you could anymore. I, I don't, I, I, th this, is, this, is, this is my dilemma. This is a thing I simply don't know. Are there still the kinds of things we had back in Amiga days where we could get someone like Ron Nicholson or Dave Needle to, to you know, take a pay cut and come give a chance at some gigantically, magnificently cool thing that, that we're trying to accomplish, where we're trying to change the world for everyone? I, I don't know. I don't know that it's out there anymore. But I'm kind of hoping that if there's anyone that could inspire people to come and try such a thing, it might be me. I might be able to pull that off. Well, we'll see. I have some serious talking to do with some serious friends. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not, not the Jerry, the other Jerry. <laughs> um, well, everything you're saying is kind of leaning around my question about you know, the solo ego, what, you know, what's new and exciting. Uh, one of the things that draws me into retro um, is not only from my childhood, but people were trying to figure out what to do with these machines. And incredible things were happening, weird things were happening. You look at the landscape today and everything's cookie cutter, you know, like in games. I've got a shooter game, I've got an adventure game. What's the difference? Oh, I've got different colored skins, what have you. Um, so in a way I'm kind of jaded because I look at it like, oh, it's just another one of those, another one of those. It doesn't have that, that spirit or that soul, but what do you see today in technology that when you look at it, you go, wow, that's exciting. I, I would like to be part of that. What, what fault pulls you in today? So the question is, you know, what's out there pulling me in today that really grabs me? I'm really, that's really cool and I want to do that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm done with consoles for, for the time being, but I, I still believe there's such huge potential there, not in the console sense, but in a, the, the smaller sort of scale sense of having good game, game consoles and everyone's home and everyone can have, you know, a rich experience and I don't know what that means. Consoles built in the TVs, modular things upgrade over time. I, d I, don't, I don't really know. I, I don't know, but I, I believe that there's that um, the, the revolution that we've seen over the last 50 years, everything getting smaller, everything's fitting in your pocket, becoming more personalized all the time. Uh, that's that's what where it's going to be at is our experiences becoming more and more personalized. The real big problem that everyone has with personalization right now is theft and security. You can't make something personal without keeping a record, and you can't keep a record without having it open to security problems and theft. And 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 so 
you know, I would love to give you exactly the web browsing experience you want, exactly the mail experience you want, but I'm afraid that if someone hacks and gets that data about you that, you know, it's going to be a bad thing for you because you want your security, you want your privacy. And so, but I, I think we're going to overcome that in every imaginable way. Part of it's going to be uh, the fact that um, we'll get better at security, we'll get better at biometrics and stuff like that, I believe. But uh, I also, you know, I, I can't tell young people. When I, I talk with them about, you know, uh, are you okay with the fact that every time you use a web browser, every time you use Gmail, or every time you use an email program, you know, someone's listening, someone's recording, and then, you know, every time you look up something on a, a, a store, now suddenly getting ads from that same product, that, are you okay with that? Is, are you okay with them, you know, invading your privacy that way? And all the young people I know say, yeah, sure. What? You mean, you're, you're asking me, am I okay with getting one minute of highly targeted ads instead of ten minutes of random, random ads? Yes. I, and what, what am I losing? What privacy am I losing? I'm okay with that. And, and you know, I, I don't know how you feel about that statement, but the thing that I've learned over and over again is it's all going to change. It's always changing. And, and, uh, and finally, the old farts will die out, and the younger people and the way they want it to be will become the way things are. And it's always changing. It's always going to happen. And security maybe may come, may go. I don't know. But that is forever going to be one of the big roadblocks to us making big progress is all of the chaos and all of the bad actors that are out there and the well-known rule in security which is when you're on the good guy's side of the equation you have a practically infinite number of holes to plug but if you're on the bad side of the equation all you're looking for is just one all you need is one not an infinite number of them and it's an impossible problem to solve I'll, I'll tell you a story out of school. I shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to. This is confidential information from back. We did a, pro, uh, a, a system called the Red Jade that was, it was the Sony PSX, the handheld Sony system about four years before Sony came out with theirs. We were working on ours. And uh, there's a, I can't remember the name of the company now, Deep Blue or, or Serious Blue or something like that. It was a collection of security people that had half come out of some microsystems and the other half came out of the NSA and we had meetings with these people and we paid them a lot of money over a number of months and the answer was nope no way to finally no real honest to God way to stop it the only serious way that they ever found to stop it was an economic one make it so expensive that it's going to take a major player to have the equipment to bust the security, to find the way around the security. And then it's a major enough player that it'll make it worth your while to go after the major player, you know, legally and, and try to get it to stop that way. But, yep, security never. No, but I, I almost hate to say this, but I'll say it anyway because I believe it. I, I think that AI is what's going to be the most interesting and fascinating best thing for humanity that's coming at us. I'm so terrified by so many things about AI. So many things. Not just the privacy and the security. Not just the singularity. And I stay awake at night thinking about the singularity. That like, oh my God, that really could happen, couldn't it? <laughs> And I also, um, I, I don't know how much you follow of any of the stuff that's going on with machine learning right now, but one of the big controversies out there is that all of the machine learn models use data. And if they use that data without the consent of the people who created the data, now we're in you know, thin ice territory, and, and, and for me, I, I don't know. I don't know where all of that's going to go. But I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm not talking about the, the, the tricks that they're doing right now. 
and and um, by the way, just to get my own uh, coined phrase in uh, in the, the zeitgeist here, uh, I call them clever parrots. All of these things that we see now, the words where they're creating beautiful graphics. Uh, a, a year ago, it was hallucinating dog heads into paintings and stuff like that. All of that collectively I call clever parrot. Getting more clever every year, better and better, but still nothing more than a, cl a, a parrot. It's not thinking, it's not, it's just putting patterns together and it's doing it magnificently well, but it's not that stuff. But I think real AI oriented stuff is coming at us where our AI will be able to learn how to be better for us, how to improve our lives, and not just in, in, in the, the, you know, the kind of obvious stuff that you might think about turning lights on and off and playing the kind of music you might want at some time of day and stuff like that, but I, I envision a world where AI is able to work with you all the time to change your everyday experiences in ways that you want, including, s you know, I don't know what it means, but systems like a game that can adapt itself using AI to know that, you know, it, you don't like the colors or you want something more than just a side scroller or, or too many paywalls. You know, something like that, that, that we'll even be able to work with that stuff and, and customize and make things better for ourselves and and um, I, I just at Google am in the process of moving over to this group called brain which is the part of its job is to make make life better for people by finding ways to apply t technology to it and and uh, and I I don't know what any of that means, but it's like right up my alley. That's where I think in that direction. And if I don't stay at Google and I go try to do stuff of my own, it's going to be in that direction where I want to work on ideas probably in the AI space that move our happiness forward, that move our enjoyment of life forward and, and make things better for ourselves. Yes, with, that um, with the AI evolution and going into technology roadmap, is there a point in time where you or engineers of your generation and the younger generation that, that do have some lineage in this have an Oppenheimer moment? Where you it goes from being an altruistic benefit to humanity to the singularity to the Terminator moment to the you know the, there's a, a, a point where you and and your cohorts are are carrying that and yeah there's some generational handoff but you're carrying it to that point. How does that does that keep you awake at night? Oppenheimer moment and you know it's funny that that, that uh, and and how do I feel about it? does it keep me awake at night and also how much am I inspired by like that I I I didn't join Amiga thinking from the beginning oh you know we're gonna change the world and and I wasn't quite that noble in the beginning and in the beginning it was a uh, just a fun thing to work on, just such a cool thing. You you might have heard me tell the story before. The short version of it is, when I was interviewing at Amiga, all of the uh, the suits told me that we're working on a game system, and then I'd go back and I'd meet with the engineers, and I could see from the drawings on the whiteboard that they, they were doing a whole computer. They weren't doing just a computer, s a game system. And, and, but they, you know, chuckled about it. And, uh, yeah, we're hiding it from the others. And the <laughs> they were hiding it from the others. And, and, and I wanted to be part of something like that. <laughs> I wanted to be in a place where people goofed around and invented such cool stuff and even, you know, did pranks with each other and, 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 
And although I found out later, by the way, that that story is only partially true because there were people like Dave Morse, who was the president of the company and who was a, an electrical, electrical engineer before he got into marketing. And so when he saw all the little extra features that were drawn on the whiteboard and hidden with, you know, like KBD instead of the word keyboard, he knew what they were talking about. <laughs> But, you know, it did, I, it's something that occurred to many of us inside as we were going along that we did have this chance to do something bigger, something better, something more meaningful than just having fun, making a toy and goofing around. And, and I, I think that's the thing that I love the most about Amiga and that I would like to try to get back again if I ever did another startup. That, that, that strange melange of we were so naive and, and idealistic and happy and unjaded, so unjaded that we thought we could do stuff like that. So unjaded that Dale, you know, seconds before they went to tape out, proposed line draw and they put it in anyway just even though it was like you know madness and any anyone with half a brain would have yelled no don't do that but we did it that spirit that that crazy inventor happy joy madness ah oh that I could get that back again someday. Any other questions? <laughs> I'm curious, during the development of the Amiga, whether it's before, after, Commodore or whatnot, were ever thoughts coming up like, oh, we should do that for like the next generation kind of stuff, like thinking of a successor or something? I gotta admit, it's getting hard to hear because of the noise next door. Could you say it again? Yeah, were you ever in the development of the custom chips thinking like, okay, we can't do this now, but this is something for the next generation, like right very in development of the Amiga at the time? The question is, you know, while we were developing the Amiga, was there anything we wished that we had done that we didn't do? And only two, uh, uh, in terms of hardware, because there's a big software one, <laughs> which is the, the, the uh, disk operating system, the DOS of the machine. I'm, I'm so happy we have any DOS at all, don't ever get me wrong about this. I sing Tim's praises to the end of days because he was there and their technology there and the Amiga wouldn't have launched without it. But boy, if it had been better, the Amiga would have been more of a contender. But um, in terms of hardware, the, the, I think the, the two biggest flaws one we didn't realize until way later, until it was way too late, which was the need for MIDI. Well, there's two of those, the need for MIDI, and we came so close to being NTSC broadcast quality signal, but we fell just short, and because we fell just short, a lot of television stations wouldn't use the Amiga because it wasn't exactly broadcast quality. So we lost out on a lot of opportunities with that, too. But we also didn't know that until it was way too late. The one that we knew, because we realized it in early debugging and testing, and we gnashed our teeth and beat our breasts that we hadn't done it, but it was way too late, but we knew we were screwed, was memory management. We didn't have a memory manager in the system. And so that meant that any bozo could write to memory location zero anytime you wanted to and bring the whole system down just by writing to memory location zero. And nothing we could do to stop it. It was an instant death for the computer. And, and, and we knew it. We knew it all along that we had screwed up, and, but it was way too late to even consider 
adding a memory management unit to the hardware, not to mention the cost. The cost would have made it prohibitive as well. But oh, we would have saved ourselves so many headaches if we had done that correctly. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, please. Topic of debate yesterday and this morning so far. We haven't really built a consensus yet. So my question to you is, how do you feel about somebody bringing a bunch of Atari stuff to an Amiga show? <laughs> so I, un I understand I'm being invited to stick my foot into a hornet's nest here. <laughs> There's some ridiculous question about bringing Atari stuff to an Amiga show. I don't understand. <laughs> no, really, is that there's some fun going on Atari stuff here? Oh, you know the whole Atari Amiga thing. We, we all knew each other, and and as engineers, and and were very fond of each other, and and admired one another's technology quite a bit. It was all the marketing and the users and stuff like that that had the the real battles about it, and, and uh, I'm uh, regarding uh, the whole Atari Amiga thing. I, I think it's fine. Oh, come on, it's fine. It's, it's all old timey stuff. Bring it all together, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, and I'm happy to admit two things. One, the uh, the Atari was clearly the, the superior machine with like its built-in MIDI, but in all other ways, the Amiga was clearly the uh, superior machine, and uh, so I don't mind if. <laughs> There's a little Atari stuff around here. <laughs> Just having some fun. <laughs> no, I meant it. <laughs> How many people were still left at Atari from, from the days of J Minor being there and all that? Or had those people already all moved on from Atari? The question is about how many Atari people were still at Atari during Amiga and stuff like that, and I, I frankly don't know. I, I know, uh, I never actually studied the Atari architecture too much, but people who have and who know tell me that the Amiga is like, you know, next generation Atari, Atari done right and stuff like that, and with a, a lot better features than what the earlier Atari hardware had. And, but that's all I know. In terms of people who came, who went, uh, you know, we, d we didn't know. And, and um, uh, the, the lawyers were, were putting a lot of awe and respect for the law into us. And so we did a lot of not looking at what other people were doing and staying away from anything official. And <coughs> like, for example, when I started doing the uh, user interface, almost right away I got word from one of the lawyers, whatever you do, do not look up patents for user interfaces because they don't want you to know, you know, and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I did the, uh, the Amiga user interface completely in the blind. I had seen user interfaces, especially the one that was on the Sun at the time that I really liked, but uh, I had to, com you know, completely black box that whole thing so that uh, you know, I'd be able to prove at some point in the future that I hadn't used anything else, that I'd just used my own technology. And I got a patent out of the deal, too. <laughs> yes, please. You can hold down the right mouse button to bring down the menus, but then you can click on multiple items before you release the right mouse button, and it, it performs those operations in order which I've never seen on another system. Did you make that, or did you have some say in that? Yeah, so the question is about when you use the right mouse button on the Amiga to bring a drop-down menu, and it's got multiple menu options. This is one of the not often used features of the Amiga interface is that you can select multiple options from the drop-down menu, and they'll be uh, executed then in the order that you select them. And... Um, uh, that is, in fact, one of the things I got a patent for, was <laughs> being able to do that. <laughs> it's hard for me to believe that, that w two things. One, that there's still, that there, there was still any space left to get patents with any of this stuff that, you know, people hadn't already grabbed all of it. 
But um, uh, uh, I've kind of risen and fallen with the importance of patents over the years. Sometimes, ooh, you know, made me some money. Sometimes, oh man, seriously got in the way of advancements in the industry. The, the, do, you, do you know the operation called uh, exclusive or? When you do it in memory, it, it uh, will, uh, when you do it in graphic memory, they, they use that operation exclusive or to create a pointer on the screen. No matter what the color is on the screen, you're creating the inverse of it with this exclusive or operation. And there is someone out there that has a patent for that operation of making something visible on a display by taking the pixel and doing an exclusive or of it. And the, the case that's called out in the patent is exactly a cursor that you can show where a cursor is by exclusive oring the memory to indicate. Uh, and I know about this because I've been called three times now as an expert witness in trials about this particular patent, including how the Amiga itself violated this particular patent. <laughs> Yeah, Dale and I are, are people that the lawyers both absolutely love and absolutely hate because in our warehouses we have all this old documentation and source listings and just the kind of stuff that the lawyers are, you know, could either absolutely love or absolutely hate. <laughs> I had one sheet of paper that completely stopped a lawsuit back uh, was... Um, uh, I had one sheet of paper that proved that the Lynx was going to do infrared multi-unit communications and uh, that we had a, uh, it working in the lab once, that it wasn't just uh, the documentation that we had that said this is what we're going to have someday, but I had one sheet of paper that was an email that told the truth that it had actually worked once in the lab one day, and it completely defeated this patent lawsuit against infrared, you know, multiplayer stuff. So bizarre that, that you know, I, uh, all the other documentation didn't matter, but the lawyers hoped that there's someone like RJ with that one sheet of paper out there. <laughs> which I particularly don't care about one way or the other, except I hate the way the patents get in the way of progress in the industry. But um, uh, w what, what I have learned, if you don't know this yet, is that law firms pay ridiculous amounts per hour for, for uh, expert witnesses. And when you tell the law firm, uh, yeah, but you know, I've got like eight or nine boxes of papers in my garage and I'm going to have to go through this. And you're going to have to pay me this, you know, Absolutely ridiculous amount of money per hour. They say, okay. <laughs> this is what I've learned being an expert witness. <laughs> yeah, there was a while there that the, that was paid for my kids to go through school, I'll tell you. <laughs> Although the most money I've ever made professionally per hour was with an Amiga game called Defender of Crown. Ask me for that story sometime if you want to hear it. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, Defender of the Crown. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say it on camera here, but. <laughs> no, somebody go get me another shot at this bourbon and <laughs> I'll tell you that story. <laughs> Use one of the hard plastic ones. I'll tell you the joke again. <laughs> Okay, who can I get to go get me some more bourbon? Everyone's nodding yes, but no one's actually doing it. Yay! <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, please. Before, but I've read somewhere that when you were a teenager, you built a tic-tac-toe game. Um, I don't know if you have a recollection of that or anything like that, but it just seemed like it might be an interesting story. Uh, speaking of patents, the question is, did I ever patent that tic-tac-toe playing computer that I built when I was 14 years old? It's a funny story. The answer is no. The short answer is no, I never patented it. I, I, I would 
I, I probably would be mortified if we ever found it again. Oh. Cheers. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so the very first version of my tic-tac-toe playing game, I sat down with pads of paper and figured out every possible tic-tac-toe game and then figured out the logic circuits to know every computer answer to every possible position that it might find itself in a tic-tac-toe game and memorialized that in, in actual, well not silicon, but they were relays, electromagnetic relays that, that, that I was running off of D batteries. And I had this whole board filled with these electromagnetic relays and had, by wiring them together correctly, created the logic that represented each and every possible position on a game and, and then stopped and thought about it after I had done that. I only did that one on paper. Stopped and thought about it and realized that tic-tac-toe games have reflections and, you know, rotations and stuff and, and realized there's actually very few actual tic-tac-toe games when you take that into account. And so I designed that in logic and built that one. I actually built that one with electromagnetic relays on a board and it had a bank of nine light bulbs and a bank of switches that you would flip to indicate which move you wanted to make. And, and it, it would play tic-tac-toe and it never lost, you know, of course. It would never lose the game against you. But it would play this tic-tac-toe game against you and, and it was, you know, so it was grossly inefficient. It was a whole board full of these electromagnetic re -re relays that were running off these D batteries. And uh, one of the lessons I learned early as a kid is how, how fast you can go through D batteries and how expensive they are and how much your father won't replace them for you. I, I learned all of those rules real early, real early and on with it. But um, uh, the... the I mean, I was, I, was, I was so proud of it that, you know, I had managed with my own hands to build this thing that, that was played with that. But I, 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 I guess, you know, was the thing that I, I probably loved the most about it was, I, it wasn't, I mean, the joy that I got making it was, but it was the sound. When you'd flip one of the switches, these electric magnetic dis electromagnetic relays, the, the, if the, the signal would propagate across the relays. And be I, I wasn't smart enough to have like a, a clock signal or anything like that. It was just all instantaneous. And you'd flip a switch and it would be sort of like, like, like wind blowing through hay. You know that, it would be just like, oh, it was so awesome. It was like, this is, if, if, this characterizes me. The, the stuff, the, the, the relays and the plain tic-tac-toe, that was cool and I loved that, but it was that sound. When I was a kid, the, the f I, I still remember the first record player that we had with the first album. It was a Beatles album. And uh, it was the very first Beatles album. And I remember everyone else sitting there mesmerized by the music, but we had it in our back porch where the sun was coming in through the window. And I was seeing this spectral reflection off of the surface and that's what I was paying attention to and everyone's like oh the Beatles yeah 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 and I'm like wow how, what's causing this what's causing rainbow here I gotta understand why is there rainbow here this is that, that that's the story of my life in that one little story right there <laughs> why is there rainbow here I should name my book that I decided if I do actually get a stone carved out to mark my passage on this planet someday. I've decided finally the thing that I want carved onto that. The, the quote for me that I want carved onto that, that stone. I want it to say, in quotes, it's a funny story. Ask me sometime. <laughs> 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 uh. 
I don't know. Am I, can I keep going? I don't know if I'm, am I stepping on someone else or something here? Any more questions? Okay. Uh. <laughs> do you have a question? I, I do actually, but uh, I'll make an announcement real quick. Um, so we did lose the internet stream for the good part. We were talking about your vision of like the of, of coming together and like generating money and rap and all that. Oh, the, the auction. So oh, too bad. We, that did not leave this room yet. It is on Robert's camera. Cool. So we'll twice. <laughs> so Robert Roth will that. We did fix the uh, stream. The hotel got a little angry because we were constantly sending like 8 megabits per second and we were kind of plugged in directly into the router. Uh, so they shut down the port part. Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys. But we're on a Wi Fi uh, hotspot that uh, Zach donated to us um, for here. This is amazing. He's like, oh, I. He was talking to Alex Perez, he's like, oh, I happen to have a Wi-Fi hotspot that's industrial business class in my car with an Ethernet port. Okay. Well, it's like, again, I'm like, go get it. So anyway, we're back online. Um, you have you have more time. Do you guys still want RJ, or should we get a break? Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, the next thing, um, yeah, you can keep going later. Like, maybe 3 o'clock, uh, maybe a little uh, 2.5 or something like um, that. I'll let you finish. And then I'll do get some of that. Oh, uh, there's actually a ton of pizza left. We'll get it for Okay, so maybe about another 20, 30 minutes? Okay. Oh. That's one of the funny stories from my Sony days. I had a person that repeat, reported to me that had a, uh, a, a product that, that was being sold online, and this person was trying to get the, the, the rating higher by having more hits on the page. This is the early, early days of Google stuff. And this employee was trying to get the hit rate up higher to get the, the product to get a higher ranking in, in, on the pages. And so when the employee went out to, to lunch before, this employee took a book. And I don't remember, I don't know the PC that well, but there's a, like, F12 is refresh of a web page or something like that. He put up the web page of his product and took this book and leaned it against his, the monitor with the tip leaning on the F12 page, the F12 key, so it would keep refreshing his page over and over again to get the bump count up high so he'd be higher in the ranking system. And it went on for about 20, 25 minutes until Google got pissed off about it and blocked Sony's IP. <laughs> We came back from lunch to find that Google had blocked Sony's IP. <laughs> that, was a, if that was a pleasant afternoon in my career at Sony, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I shouldn't tell you his name. Fred! <laughs> no, it wasn't Fred. It wasn't Fred. Yes, please. Uh, so, uh, someone that went out, right? What you got from the factory, from the offices, the last day that you left uh, the building. And why? Commodore went down. What did people grab from the building? And why? Oh, sadly, I wasn't there. I was already long gone. And uh, uh, I had already taken what I wanted out. And there was so much more that if I knew it was going to happen, I would have gotten out there. But in, in, in many cases in my life with the companies that got shut down, they did it in the middle of the night without telling people. Williams Electronics, where we did all those absolutely awesome arcade games and they did all those pins and stuff like that. They, uh, gosh, it's decades ago now. But they shut down the whole operation, and they did it in the middle of the night. They took all of that stuff, not just all the prototypes and all the cool stuff, the art that the artists had hanging on the walls and in the cabinets, the, the prototype art for Joust and all of that stuff. They scooped it all up and threw it in dumpsters in the middle of the night, didn't tell anyone until it was all gone. My God, I couldn't believe it. When I heard that, and it was when I was still at Amiga when that happened. I became this pack rat. I started collecting all of this stuff because I've always been afraid since then that they're going to throw away the good stuff and, and that I would lose, you know, the, some of that stuff. Fortunately, it's not just me. Not just me. 
I, I don't hold the kale to people like Dale Luck. Dale Lux, <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> thank I. <laughs> But, you know, he, he and I both are suffering the same problem. We've got so much good stuff that the museums are done. They're full. And so now what do we do with it? And like I said, I have this idea. I'd love to go around the, the world with it and let people actually touch it. How cool would it be instead of hearing about an Agnes stu t stack to actually touch an Agnes stack would be so nifty. But... Um, but I, I, I especially like the idea, if collectors want it, the part I don't know, so I don't, I don't know if collectors really want this stuff enough to pony up some dough for it. They might not. They might not care enough for it. Uh, we'll find out. If not, it's going back into the, my attic or something else like that. So I said to Dale, I said, oh, so you've got to get out of this warehouse, you know, and, and I'm using this opportunity. I'm cleaning house. I'm, I'm going to keep maybe a little bit of it, but most of it I'm either going to sell or give away or we'll do this auction or something. I'm cleaning house. I'm, I'm fixing up my life. I'm clearing up my life. What are you going to do? Dale says, well, I'm going to get another warehouse closer to, my, <laughs> closer to my home and just move everything over there. It's like, dude, are you kidding? Uh, I love Dale so. He's so awesome. Dale, you, the, here's a story you probably don't know. I, I moved out to California from Chicago, and I was, it was so weird. It was really weird. My family did scare me. They managed to spook me about how different, how strange, how odd it was going to be. And, uh, and I was a, a real fish out of water. I was just really, you know, what does any of this really mean? And and, and it was even weirder for me, you might not know, I gave up smoking cigarettes when I drove across country to join Amiga. I had been a cigarette smoker before, and then I wasn't when I got there, and so I'm a fish out of water. I can't go and have a cigarette and calm myself down and all of that. And, and it was Dale to my rescue. Dale was from Wisconsin, and I was from Illinois. We were both Midwestern people, and Dale... If you've ever met Dale, the, 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 the Wisconsin has never left Dale. Dale is still as gruff and plain speaking and unshaven as he ever was the whole time I've known him. If you want to see what a California homeless person looks like, go <laughs> look at Dale. Such an awesome human being. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, please. I don't really like to really slam them on purpose. They did me wrong. And, uh, and I didn't like it, and so I kind of tried to scrub that whole story out of my history. And I, I digitally took my name out of the art in the in the game itself, so if you go play the game, my name's not there. But I couldn't stop them from putting my name on the box, and so it's on the box, but it's not in the game. <laughs> they were just jerks. I, I don't want to name names and stuff, but they were just jerks to me, and I was young, I was naive, and they took advantage of me being young and naive, and they screwed around with the wrong person. <laughs> but I just... But there was so much f that was fun and awesome when that game was develop uh, under development. I can't find it anymore. I wonder if w one of the Amiga archivists could find it. It might be on the discs at my house right now. Oh, it almost for sure is on the discs at my house right now. Uh, when we were developing Defender of the Crown, I was not just developing that game, but I had created an underlying game system that you could use to create a bunch of games on. And give me another plot, another work of art and, and music and stuff, and we'll create a new game, new logic. And, uh, and one of the parts that I was developing, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to tell you this story. <laughs> this is a sexist story. I'm sorry, but it's true. The, uh, one of the, uh, the demos that I had created that I sent to my masters at CinemaWare as proof that I was making progress on the development <coughs> 
I needed, I, I created a demo that showed that my game engine was now able to respond to mouse clicks. And I wanted to show them. It wasn't in there yet. And, I, and the, re the, the way that I created a demo that showed it responding to mouse clicks and the demo that I sent to my masters at CinemaWare, if, if you know the game, Defender of the Crown, there's this beautiful moment in the game when the, the you and the princess that you're trying to save are walking toward each other on the screen. In this case, you're portrayed as a male and the prin princess is portrayed as a female, which is important to the story. And as you're walking toward each other in the animation that they gave me, I created an extra animation that would work when you clicked on the mouse. I just wanted to see if it would work and I was testing animation and all relative positioning and stuff like that. And I had this like pink, pinkish sort of tube come out from the guy, sort of, <laughs> sort of at waist level, sort of. <laughs> sort of extending toward her, sort of. And, and as he walked, it was testing the relative positioning. It was supposed to move with him and, and grow longer still. And the more you click the button. And, and my friends at CinemaWare admitted once that this demo escaped out into the Amiga community. It's supposedly out there somewhere. If anyone ever finds it, I'd love to see it again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. So we were live streaming on YouTube, and there's a couple questions that. Oh, good. Uh, the first one is: Did you consider the 6810 instead of the 68000? And the second is: uh, Let's see. Can you please tell the joke with the two prostitutes who go to a bar? <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, 6810 uh, didn't exist when we made the Amiga. The easy answer to that one is it simply didn't exist. 68,000, we knew that more were coming, but it, it simply didn't exist. And, uh, uh, and, and that's a shame because that was just an awesome processor. It was even better than 68,000, but man, my heart of hearts goes with the 68,000. Oh, I love that processor so much. I used to know every, uh, every op code, the, you know, the cycle count for every op code, and oh, God, it was just so wonderful. But uh, yeah, no, 68,000 didn't exist. And uh, sorry, I've completely fire forgotten the second half of your question. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. The, the truth is that that's, that's my go-to one-liner joke when I don't really have a joke to tell. I tell, I say, so these two, pra but I do know a couple of walks into a jo bar jokes. Is, uh, the, uh, let's see, was it the first, uh, f uh, the first mathematician walks into a bar and he says, I'll have, uh, 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 I'll have one beer. And the second, bar, uh, second mathematician walks up to the bar and says, I'll have a half a beer. And the third mathematician walks up to the bar and says, I'll have a, a quarter of a beer, an eighth of a beer, a sixteenth of a beer. And finally the bartender says, ah, screw all you guys, here's two beers. And he, see, that's a, that's a, that's a math joke. You got to kind of, kind of, yeah, 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 shut up, shut up. <laughs> okay, here's a math joke for you. Okay, here's a fun joke. My, uh, my uh, 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 stepfather, Gene Canfield, died a bazillion years ago now. It was real sad. He was a, a brilliant scientist, science at Lawrence Livermore Labs. The guy was just a genius guy. And, uh, and half the people that were at his little funeral party that we had were family and friends and stuff like that. But fully the other half were fellow scientists from the lab, you know, the real serious, full-on, geeky scientists. And, and they asked me to say a speech at, at his memorial service, and I opened with that I really realized that Gene Canfield was dead the other day when I first heard a joke, that when I heard it, I said, oh, God, I got to call Gene and tell him this joke right now, and realized he was gone, and I couldn't call him up and tell him that joke. And I said, I'd tell you that joke right now, but I got to warn you, it's a real geeky science joke. 
you sure? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, tell us a joke. So I told him the joke, which is this. I said, oh, I got one of those. Wait, 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 let me make sure I get it right. I got, I got one of those new Heisenberg cars. Oh, it's really gay, great, but the only problem is every time I look at the speedometer, I get lost. <laughs> so it was like, it's like kind of a, kind of a math science <laughs> joke there. You get the idea. Okay, fine. <laughs> Did they like it? Well, the... The, the Lawrence Livermore people laughed a lot at it. They thought it was great, but the family's like, what's that mean? <laughs> Never mind. I'm not going to try to explain it. I know good racy walked into the bar joke, but maybe I better tell that one off camera too. <laughs> to remind me, it's the guy walks into a bar, and he's looking sad. He's looking glum. He's looking morose. And he's got like, you know, a, a brown grocery bag with him, which he sets down on the bar. That it's, t remind me to tell you that joke. He sits down on the bar and the bartender says, why are you so glum, chum? Why so blue? The guy says, oh man, you'd be blue if you had the troubles I had. Bartender says, what? What troubles? He says, let me show you. He says, he, he reaches, stands up and he reaches into this grocery bag and he rustles around for a second. And he comes out with a, a grand piano a full grand piano, a little miniaturized small one, which he sets down on the bar and he reaches in, he grabs a little stool. And he says, the bartender says, this makes you sad? This is incredible. Remind me to tell you this joke later. It's really great. <laughs> <laughs> bartender says, what makes you sad? What? This is incredible. The guy, the guy says, wait for it. Wait for it, he says. He stands up again, he reaches in, he rustles around in the bag. He pulls out a person an actual person that's moving, animated, wearing a tuxedo with the tails and everything like that, about, you know, about a foot tall or so, sets the person in front of the stool. The person sits down, does the tails behind this bench thing, and sits down at the piano and starts to rip off some Rachmaninoff like you've never heard. It's just amazing. It's beautiful. The bartender says, this is what's making you sad? The guy says, Wait for it, wait for it. He reaches into the bag. He rustles around for a second. He comes up with this brass lamp. You know the kind you rub and a genie comes out and grants you your wishes? And he shows it to the bartender. He says, what's that? The guy says, it's one of those brass lamps where you give it a rub and a genie comes out and grants you your wishes. The bartender says, can I try it? And the guy says, sure, help yourself. So the bartender takes the ramp, he lamp, he rubs it, and a genie comes out. And the genie says, your wish is my command. And the bartender says, really? Looks at the guy, guy says, the bartender says, I don't know, a, a million bucks? I, I wish for a million bucks. And the genie says, your wish is my command. Poof. And suddenly, the bar is filled with ducks. Ducks everywhere, ducks flying, ducks you know, pooping on the benches, ducks everywhere, feathers getting in people's mouths. The bartender says, what the hell? Get these ducks out of here. He says to the guy, he says, why are all these ducks here? What the hell's wrong? How come these ducks are here? And the guy says, oh, you think I asked for a 12-inch pianist? And with that, I think my time's probably over. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you. This was a lot of fun. <laughs>